Good morning. Coming through? We're going to be looking at uh, Numbers 10 this morning, talking about the trumpets and setting out. It, I've, something I've noticed that seems to be a recurring theme of our society, and I, you know, I'm so much more connected to American society than world society, so I don't know if this is a world trend. But in, in the United States, it certainly is a trend, and that is suicide. A lot of people are committing suicide, and sometimes, like two very prominent people committed suicide in the past week, and neither of them had really given a lot of warning signs. The, the people close to them, like, what's her name, Spade? What? Kate. Kate, the designer, her husband was, he had no concept that she was struggling with anything. And then the chef, Anthony Bourdain, how do you say his name? It looks French, Bourdain, whatever. And I, I so I, you know, a lot of times, because we have news and it's so readily available, we'll think there are more of a particular thing just because we're hearing about it. This is certainly the case with earthquakes and some of these things. They, there are always a lot of them. But I was looking at statistics on suicides, and they're going up quite, well, you know, like 30%. You know, there's not a lot. In a, if you look at total numbers compared to, uh, you know, how many mi million people we have, but there are quite a few people that are committing suicide. And, you know, when you look at gun deaths, how many of you realize that over two-thirds of gun deaths are suicides? A suicide? Yeah, that, I mean, every 11 minutes? Yeah, see, and, and have you ever wondered what, what happens to us, what, what happens to our spirit that we don't want to live? Because we understand that, uh, and I, everybody's had a bad day, and people have had bad weeks and bad years, but it, it's always astonishing to me when we see people that have achieved everything that we think is worthwhile, money, fame, family, security, and then they commit suicide. Uh, and I read, I read one, uh, I think it was, Alan Bloom, who wrote a book, I think, called The Closing of the American Mind uh, a few years back. But he pointed out that he, and you certainly, you have to be careful that you never look at one suicide and say, this is what happened, because you don't know. You, it, you can't judge. I, I'm totally out of that. But a society that keeps the members kill themselves, and especially productive people, People that have every reason to be happy. In fact, the people close to them thought they were. And, and he, Professor Bloom said that he believes that it's the loss of morality in the culture because what he, and he did a very good job of showing this, when with, without precepts, morals, ethics, we start losing sight of what makes life valuable. You know, what are we living for? And, and again, I'm very careful not to put my finger on any one thing for an individual because I have to admit, I've never experienced the kind of anguish that I've seen other people go through. And, and I'm not judging that. But I'll, I do wonder what's going on in our society when people are increasingly killing themselves. And... Um, in fact, I, I've mentioned this to you before, and Joy and I were talking about the other day. I'm very careful to talk about Jezebel spirits and Ahab, and Christians sometimes do this in a frivolous way, in my view, and name everything. But with, I'll kind of date it with Roe versus Wade. There's something going on in American culture, and it's not just American culture, but that we have an obsession with death. And we have an obsession with living my life for me. 
and I'll explain this. What, what is the main reason for abortion? Inconvenience. Convenience for whom? The woman. For the woman and possibly the man. Yeah. Uh, is it for the baby? No. And so you ask yourself, there's something inside of us that wants to take care of ourselves, but there's also something inside of us that doesn't find meaning in it. If you just live for yourself, you'll come to the end of meaning. And you'll find that when they, they see people that are depressed, and believe me, depression is a real thing and can be a biochemical thing, and again, I'm not judging that. But sometimes one of the first steps out of depression is if there's some way to step out of yourself, <laughs> to live for someone else. And when you look at suicide, again, without any judgment, suicide is that thing that says, I can't live with myself. This is going to be hard on my family and my children, whatever, but I, this, this pain or whatever is so great, I've got to end it. And in our society, we... It's interesting to me that the right to abort is connected to the freedom or the choice of women. Because what's increasingly evident is that women are not allowed to choose to give their lives away to raise a family. It's not a popular choice. And if you don't believe me, I challenge you to read your newspaper, read a magazine, sit down and watch TV programs, and find the number of women that aren't out making a career, but they're home taking care of children. And see if that is shown to be valuable, to see if that's shown to have meaning. And here's what I'm going to tell you, is that certainly women can have careers. They're as smart as men, probably smarter, but there's no reason to hurt ourselves. But there's something in a woman that finds meaning in raising children. That, not every woman is going to have children. But when p our society has done some interesting things in terms of self-obsession, you'll notice that we have the right to abort, and now we're saying that if I don't like my identity, I can change it. And Joy and I were talking about this in our marriage that we found out the first four or five years, we were trying very hard to fix the other one. <laughs> and we knew one day she'd get it right. <laughs> and one day you wake up and you go, you know what? God made joy just the way he wanted her. And he's waiting for me to wake up and cherish who she is and not try to change anything. That's all about not me. Because everything in me wants to take care of me. But when I am so obsessed with protecting myself and doing what's fun for me, and, and uh, I was reading this story of a woman that got divorced with her, from her husband after 30 years, and she made this comment that he was never there. When he was there, he wasn't there. He wasn't present. I don't think he was unfaithful. I, he was just doing his work. He was busy. He was never there. And she just couldn't stand it, finally. I'm not saying she's right or she's wrong. But I'm saying this culture we have of self-obsession is turning in on itself. And I think suicide is one of the symptoms. Not judging anybody that's involved. Believe me, if you've been around people with mental issues or severe depression or whatever, it is nothing to make light of. And if someone commits suicide, it's a tragedy. It breaks our heart. It's not a time for judgment. It just isn't. You, you know, it's, it, but when you look at this, you know, the changing of identities, I, I'm, now we're going to raise children gender neutral so they can choose their gender at some point. What you're going to find if you look at the Torah portion today is God said, I've got 12 tribes and this is the order. If you're Reuben, you're fourth. If you're Judah, you're first. Get over it. That's what it is. And cherish what God's given you to do. The, the, the whole thing that has us focusing on ourselves, which is natural, normal, I've done it my whole life, 
like I mentioned with Joy and me, we have found out our marriage is so much better when we appreciate who the other one is. And if there needs to be change, let God do it. It takes a lot of patience, but you'll find that as our focus is outside of us, we still have problems, but we find fulfillment and meaning. When you look at the whole concept of the cross of Yeshua, it's that he did something entirely for others. It wasn't for him. But it was for him because he didn't want to lose fellowship. He didn't want to be separated. And I think, again, when I look at women, I'm glad that women have all these chances for jobs and different things, but I see a lot of women going into their 50s without a family and there's something missing because they... They were told that they were going to find meaning in a job, in fame, in money. And I can guarantee you, whatever it is, it might be raising a family, it might be something else, something that gets you outside of yourself and pouring your life out is where you're going to find meaning. And the gender thing, the whole sexual revolution thing, what's that about? I want you to think about what's the whole sexual revolution about? It's about me. It's about what I want. It's what fulfills my needs. It's what I want now. How is it working? You know, if, if you just get totally secular here and look at sexual satisfaction in the U.S., where is it today compared to 1950? You may not look at these kind of things. I do. It's dropped big time. People aren't happy. Why? Because they're focusing on themselves. And, uh, you know, this became so evident to me that when I look at the people I grew up around and what I've seen, and when I've seen real joy in people, it's the ability to give yourself away. You need to take care of yourself. You're important. You have value. Like Ron said, I love that song too that says, I haven't forgotten you. God remembers who you are. But there's, there's something in it, and as I was looking at this Torah portion and, and the, the setting out, and it just struck me when I hear the news and when I look at what's going on. Uh, it, it, here, it, another thing that's interesting, too, is that in our obsessions to get things right, we overreact. And so you'll notice that Roseanne Barr is not allowed to call a black woman the daughter of an ape, which I agree, that's disgusting. But it's okay to call Trump an orange baboon. Yeah. It's, in fact, that's what normal people do, It's call Trump an orange baboon. Really? And, and everything is so shaped by what's acceptable. And I'm just going to tell you today, I'm a little off topic. If we're following the king, we're not going to be friends with this world. This world is, it, it's, there are so many good people in the world and so many good things out there, but this world system has got something rotten in it. And it's mistreating our youth when it tells them the number one thing you need is the right to choose your gender, the right to choose your sexual persuasion, the right to choose whether or not you want to have children, and all of that's bunk. You go, like Ron says, and find out, what does God say you need to do? And if you need to go on a boat to China, go on a boat to China. But I can guarantee you, you're not going to find happiness if it's all about you. Even though I'm wired that way and I suspect a lot of you are too. You ask Joy, she found out right after she married me that this guy thinks it's all about him. She tells me that all the time. And I told her, I says, this is the body of a Greek god. She said, it's a Swiss peasant. So I, there's just nothing nice in my house. We have some fun conversations. <laughs> but seriously, one of the things that always comes back to me, I grew up around a lot of people that were pioneers that founded this community. And, uh, you know, it's even some of you that are still here, Jerry and Doug, Karma, Colleen, different ones. Jerry and Colleen, other than my dad and mom, Jerry and Colleen were my dorm parents for most of my life. And what I've looked at as I've looked at the people I grew up around, 
is the more they poured their life out for other people, the happier they are, the more fulfilled they are. I look at the little things that Jerry does, and I still watch Jerry. You know, Jerry was interested in sports a little, so we would run and throw and jump and things, and he was good at everything. That was disgusting. But Jerry found a lot of joy in just taking the kids and going up to the mountain, mm -hmm. going to a cave. In fact, I think 90% of the caves I've been to is because Jerry took me. I really find true happiness in the people that their lives are here for other people. And I think if there's something that's not working in our society today is we're trying to make everything revolve around me. What I want, what works for me, and here's what I think is interesting. When I decide what's right for me, it changes. What's working today doesn't work tomorrow. I mean, can you imagine a child of eight or nine deciding what gender they are? And somebody starting them on hormone treatments. See, to me, that's child abuse. And, and I was listening to somebody talk the other day as a teenager that's getting ready for surgery. And I mean, I'm enough medical, I'm reading this description and I'm getting sick to my stomach. But it's not out of hatred, it's not out of putting this person down, it's that I think someone has sold them a bill of goods. I believe when the scripture, like we're going to look at this Torah portion, it says, Aaron, you've got a job, you blow the silver trumpets. Then it takes the 12 tribes and it says, you've got a job, you do it this way. Everybody has value, but find out who you are and be that. Don't try to be something you're not so that you'll feel good about yourself. You know, Ron mentioned uh, public speaking, and I, most people just do not like it. And you're right, John Hansen hates it. <laughs> John and I have had a lot, he just, and I keep telling you, just be yourself. One of the things we do when we get up in front of people, I've done this too, is try to be like someone that we thought did a good job. Guess how that usually looks? <laughs> not so good, right? <laughs> uh, be yourself. And, and it also, we can improve, there's no question. I've never forgotten taking a speech class in uh, college. Was, I think it was my freshman year. No, was it? No, it was my sophomore year because it was at Logan. My teacher was Art Smith. I don't remember any of my professors. I remember him. Because what we had to do is give our speeches on video and then watch them. That reminded me that I don't like that old scenario. When I was growing up, they told me when we came to the judgment bar, I was going to sit down and see a, a video of my whole life. And I'm thinking, Lord, nuke me now. I don't want to deal with that. I want to see myself. But you'd watch yourself speak. And every little, I, I keep doing this. My whole life, I've, and I, I see myself... And the other thing I did, which I pretty much stopped, was because uh, uh, I thought that silence would bother people. It doesn't bother them at all. Just shut up. If you haven't got anything to say, you don't, you don't need to, uh, and then the next word. But it was funny, all the things I watched myself. And uh, you can change. You can improve. But really, it's amazing when you look at Scripture that how God created you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that the plan he has for your life is wonderful, and that the best thing we can do in the Lord is help people find out who he made them and cherish and honor who they are. This dissatisfaction with who we are, where we came from, where does it go? You know, Ron mentioned some of the issues he had with his dad. This is common. That one parent or another, or a teacher or something, and, and we'll usually go for a good share of our life thinking, well, that person did such and such, and then one day the Holy Spirit says, do you realize that it's all your judgments against this person that's messing you up? It's not the person. <laughs> because life's about what you can control, not what the other person can do. Dean.
You, you exactly do. In fact, I'm very grateful for my parents, just wonderful parents. But when you read scripture, we all are called to accept the parents because who chose them? God did. And when I'm in rebellion against my parents, I'm in rebellion against God. This doesn't mean your parents did everything right, and there are some horrible parents. I get that. But you still come to peace with who God made you. Anyway, let's look at this Numbers passage. The passages today are going to deal a lot with what God's called us to do. And they're also going to deal with something that's a struggle. And that is, in our life, some things we shouldn't tamper with, and other things God's called us to model, to <coughs> persuade, and to move around. And, and, and you'll see this. In fact, as we start out, I want you to think about a shofar as compared to a silver trumpet. Who made the shofar? God did, right? God made the shofar. That's why you're not allowed to put a mouthpiece on it. It's all to be how God made it. Now we're going to look at silver trumpets. And who makes those? People do. Numbers 10, the Lord, this is Yahweh, spoke further to Moses saying, Make yourself two trumpets of silver, of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and having the camps set out. This passage is very difficult for the reason that when they translate it, we don't, we don't have companion words in English for what's in Hebrew. And so it'll be saying blowing and summoning using the same words when in Hebrew they're different words which makes it much clearer. It's Numbers 10. So make yourself two trumpets. When both are blown, and the word here is taka or takia. The takia is the long note or the note that's blown. All the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the door of the tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, the same word takia, and a long... Uh, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, alarm is teruah. Now you probably remember these, but the tekiah is just the long note. Or the teruah is an alarm. See, and so when you read this, if you, if you understood Hebrew, it's, it's much more detailed than it is in English. So if you, if you blow two, the congregation gathers. You blow one, the leaders gather. If you blow the alarm, then the camp's pitched on the east set out. Who's the camp on the east, Ron? Judah. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. They are on the east, and they're the first ones who set out. So when the alarm is blown, those three go. Then the next are the three on the south, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And uh, what's amazing to me is how God set these order out, this order out, and I got thinking about it. If you were in Reuben and you wanted to leave third, you couldn't because that's not where you're put. And there's something, how many of you know that it's not American to let somebody tell you what to do? <laughs> it's just, you know, I'll decide for myself and I kind of laugh. Both Joy and I come from a bit of independent families, so we raised some independent children without trying to. And uh, I'm sure you've all faced this where you need the child to do something, there's a way to do it but they would rather die than do it the way you're telling them to do it. In fact, I, I look at, uh, well, let's just say I have some grandchildren that have seem to be evidencing some of these same characteristics. <laughs> you know, and yet here's God saying, Reuben here, Simeon here, and that's how it goes. When the teruah is blown, when you Sound an alarm the second time, the camp's pitched on the south, so set out. An alarm is to be blown for them to set out. When covering the assembly, when convening the assembly, however, you shall blow, again, this word, takiyah, without sounding an alarm. 
So the alarm, at least so far, is to direct the congregation to leave, to get ready to go. The priestly sons of Aaron shall blow the trumpets. This shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. And it actually uses the word ruah twice. What does that mean in Hebrew when we use a word twice? It's emphasis. Emphasis. That's, you know, in English we have different forms of the word, good, better, best. In Hebrew, you just will double the word. Listen, listening. Hearing, hear. You know, that kind of thing. It just emphasis. So when you're, when you're in war, you have an alarm with an alarm that you may be remembered before the Lord and be saved from your enemies. Verse 10, also in the day of your gladness, your appointed feasts on the first days of your months, you shall blow, that's the tekiah, the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God, I am the Lord your God. Another problem that you have is most of our English Bibles don't distinguish between a trumpet and a shofar. Now, it's not that that's bad, it's just confusing. It would be like Doug writing a score for an orchestra and calling the violas violins. They're not. They work together. They're just not the same thing. I want, to, I want to take just a minute with you about this concept of what we should change and what we shouldn't. And, and it's a, it, it can be a difficult thing. Go to Deuteronomy 27, verse 5. What things are we allowed to shape and change and what things should we not touch? Because it's very amazing to me that God has the trumpet, which is man-made, and the shofar, which is very clearly God's creation. And I'll read you some, uh, some concepts that the Jews have about that. But Deuteronomy 27, 5. Moreover, you shall build there an altar to Yahweh your God, an altar of stones. And what about these stones? You shall not wield an iron tool on them. You shall build the altar of the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God. Why doesn't God want his altar to be built with cut stones? How many of you know, and I'm not a builder, but would it be easier to make an altar of cut stones or uncut stones? Cut stones every time. I mean, it's... It, when you, I've seen some people that are really good at rock work, but how many of you know to just take stones the way they are and make a beautiful wall or something is quite a job because they just don't fit together. You, you have to try this and try that. You, the, the altar of the Lord cannot have a stone tool used on it. Now, I'd like you to go back to the story of the Tower of Babel. I don't know how many of you have picked this up before, but this has an amazing statement in this. If you go to Genesis 11. And, 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 I, and, and you can help me because I've been thinking about this all week. Why over our offerings, why for feasts, is God asking us to blow something made by man and something that can't be made by man? Or do both. If you go to Genesis 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Look at the next statement. And they used brick for stone. And they used tar for mortar. This is telling you that this was a different way of building than they had built before. What's the difference between a brick and a stone? Man-made and God-made. How many of you knew that the Tower of Babel was made out of bricks? It, it's, it's one of those things you're not looking for, and so you miss it. And I think it was, it was a Brad Scott. Somebody pointed this out, and it was like, I didn't see it. It says right there, they used brick for stone and tar for mortar. In other words, they did something different. 
What was the purpose of this tower? To reach into heaven, wasn't it? It was. Uh, there's some really weird stories. Yeah, make a name for ourselves. Some weird stories about this in the tower in the book of Jasher. Anybody remember these? Shooting an arrow into the heavens and, and they came, down with blood on them. came down with blood on them. As a child, I re the book of Jasher was a great book. <laughs> <laughs> Karma. Well, it could be, and I think, you know, that's, that, the, the thing, I guess, that really is uh, the Lord comes down on here is they wanted to make a name for themselves, but there's a sense that they wanted to lift themselves above God, that they wanted to challenge God. And I, and I think, you know, Ron mentioned this this morning, and this is something I try to remember every day. Every talent I have, every ability I have came from God. Every ingredient I use comes from God. I have every reason to be humble. He's merciful, I can breathe, but there is sometimes when we make something great, whether it's music, a building, we start thinking that the genius came from us. And have you ever stopped to think about this? How many of you gave yourself the intellect you have? Not one of us, we know that. Every ability we have, we can develop our abilities, but you know, it's, I think you've probably all noticed this too, that people are born with different tendencies. I mean, it's like in our family, my siblings, there's eight, there are eight of us. There are three boys. We couldn't be more different than if you tried. I love animals. The first time I saw a cow, it was a love affair. I like cows. And when I saw Roger Waite breeding cows artificially, I'm like, I want to do that. And everybody else is going, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> gross. And Tim, he's five years old and he says, Daddy, can I have that clock? Well, sure. Dad comes back in. The clock is apart and all over the whole house. But he kept doing this and Dad kept getting him clocks till he knew how to put them back together. Tim just has a genius for this kind of thing. I think it's boring. I want my clocks to work and don't take them apart, please. And James is his whole, I mean, you have to be careful when you talk to James because it's like, I'm just not a got to the same grade you did. I point this out and I bet every one of you in your families it's this way. You see these similarities, but there are things put in there by God that are unique and different. And you'll find, you know, this is something I've shared a lot lately because the Lord's really shown me that every human being is creative. None of us are creators. We're creative. And some people take flour and eggs and salt and they make wonderful creations. Some people grease and oil and a welder and they do fantastic things. Like what Ron did yesterday. Take that water heater. It's a bigger one. Put it in a new place. You have to replumb it. It's creative. God gives us this ability to take what He's given us and create things. But we're all different. And it's to celebrate who we are. But when you look at this, this story here in uh, Genesis 11, I thought it was significant that they were going to make a name for themselves. And the first thing they did is they said, we are going to define the building stones. And so they built something that was an altar to them, not an altar to God. Douglas. I ever wondered what that common language was then? Yeah, it would probably be Hebrew, I would guess. Hebrew or what they call Proto-Hebrew, you know, early. Paleo, yeah. But, I mean, who knows? Well, the only problem is, is the only problem is, is Greek came so long after Hebrew. 
but I'll be the first to say I'm not going to fight over it because I don't know. Uh, the, the, uh, many people are saying now that what appears to be the first rudiments of the alphabet came out of the Mesopotamia area. And I don't think anybody knows exactly what that language is. No, it's, it's interesting. And, and the thing that, that sticks out to me here, you don't build an altar with cut stones. They built this thing to be a tribute to them. They built it out of bricks. And uh, when, when you look, at, you know, Ron talked about the sanctuary today, and it's very interesting to look at the sanctuary and to notice how things were commanded to be made. Like, you know, the, the trumpets are to be made out of beaten silver, but the menorah is out of beaten gold. They were to take a talent of gold. They were not allowed to make a mold. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be the easy thing with gold? Make a mold, heat up the gold, pour it in. That's not how you're, you can't do it that way. And uh, got some things here. This is some Jewish input on the, uh, the shofar. The shofar, whose purpose is to rouse the divine and the listener, may not be constructed of an artificial instrument. It must be an instrument in its natural form and naturally hollow through whom sound is produced by human breath, which God breathes into human beings. This pure and natural sound symbolizes the lives it calls Jews to lead. What is more, the most desirable shofar is the bent horn of a ram. The ram reminds one of Abraham's willing sacrifice of that which was most precious to him. The curve in the horn mirrors the contrition of the one who repents. In other words, what is the acceptable sacrifice? A broken and contrite. So, interesting things. But when, the temp when Solomon dedicated his temple, do you remember what was happening when the Spirit of God fell so strongly they had to leave? 120 priests were blowing trumpets in humanism. Not shofars, trumpets. And so I, I've been kind of uh, thinking about this all day. Again, this very common Jewish concept that the bend and the shofar represents repentance. The ability of the person to, to bend to the spirit. There's a statement in Jeremiah that kind of goes along with this. He says, Be appalled, O heavens, this is Jeremiah 2, and shudder. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder, be very desolate, declares Yahweh. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to you for, the, to you for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I just point this out, that all through human history, there are places that we try to replace what God has given us with what seems good to us. And yet God tells us to make the silver trumpet. So I, I think one of the things that's become very clear to me is that God gives us commands and he gives us absolutes. And, and maybe I'll go through this, some of this procedure next and then we'll talk about this. One of the most dangerous things I can do is to look what Doug is doing and see it so good and then imitate it unless I'm called to. There's, there's something about being happy with what God's given you to do and celebrating that and not being upset over what other people are doing. And you'll find it all through Scripture. Let's read this next part. So we started off with the, the silver trumpets, which are made by man, and God asked them to be blown in almost every, civil, almost every similar situation to the shofar. Their alarms, to call people together. And I would suggest if you don't know that you, uh, you can even get a free Bible program like the Word. Is that the free one we have? And it will tell you what the words are. Whenever you read trumpet, check and make sure, is this a shofar or is it a chasatzara? They're totally different. And I don't, I'm not sure why the English translators didn't just say, and maybe some Bibles are doing this. Do some of you have Bibles that say ram's horn? That would be much better if they'd say ram's horn where it's a shofar and a trumpet. Then you'd have a better idea. Okay, now in the second year, this is verse 11. In the second month, on the 20th of the month, the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony. And the sons of Israel set out on their journeys. So they moved for the first time according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses. 
The standard in the camp of the sons of Judah, according to their army, set out first with Nachshon, the son of Amminadab, Nathaniel, over the Issachar, and Eliab. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who were carrying the tabernacle, set out. So you see what happened? Let's say this, I am the sanctuary. I'm the middle of the camp. On my east, Ron knows this, the rest of you should learn it. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, they're out on the east. On the south is Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Over here on the west are the sons of Rachel. Makes it easy. Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. Then on the north is Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. You're not going to remember them that quick. But those three set out, and then the people responsible for the structure of the sanctuary took it down. The beams and the curtains, and they set out. Why? Because they needed to be at the destination and set up before Kohath got there with the sacred vessels. This is very carefully choreographed. I'm taking a little bit of time with it because do you all understand the mess if Kohath wanted to go at the same time of Gershon and Merari? You need to go when you're called to. So the tabernacle was taken down. Next to so after Gershon and Merari took the, the beams and the curtains, then it was Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And then Kohath sets out in verse 21 with the holy objects. So they've got the Ark of the Covenant, they've got the menorah, they've got everything in the sanctuary that Ron talked about this morning. And then it goes Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, Naphtali. And it talks about uh, rule, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. But somewhere it says, oh yeah, in verse 21 it points out that the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. So the, the, everything was carefully laid out. Now, I take a lot of time with this because I think it's important. Order and sequence. Order and sequence. Some things are obvious. If I'm going to do a surgery, I don't do the surgery until the animal's anesthetized. For one thing, they won't let me. Then I don't do anything until it's clipped. I still don't do anything until it's washed and sterilized with betadine. And then I'll put on a last wash of alcohol. Then if it's a, you know, a dog or a cat, I'll put a drape over it. I don't start the surgery till I've totally prepared it. Everything is sequential. If you watch Johnny on the fields, it's exactly the same. If you could have watched Ron yesterday putting in the water heater, it would have been the same. He had sequences he had to follow. He couldn't just throw that thing in there and hook it up. Sometimes in our spiritual walk, we want to be at point three without going through point one and point two. It just doesn't work. Sequences are essential. You can't avoid them. And I, I talked a little bit about this earlier. One of the problems with our society today is we say certain things are better than other things, and so people want to be something they're not. It, and I think racism is a terrible evil. It's polluted our society, but we can't let what's happening now do the same thing, and we're reverse racism. Now it's, now it's okay to say a horrible thing about a Jew or a white, but you can't say it about a black. You can't say horrible things about other people. <laughs> and, and here's another interesting thing. We've had several people that so badly wanted to be a minority that they represented themselves as a minority. There's a present senator in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, for all her life she passed herself off as an Indian. She hasn't got one drop of blood in her from any Native American source. There's another lady, Rachel, and I forgot her name, who's Dolezal. Good yeah, for you, Dolezal. Sharon. Yeah. That represented herself as black. And she's not. And what's funny is people were kind of kind to them. I think they should be merciless. I, there's something wrong with wanting to be what you're not. It, it gives people the wrong impression. What you are is wonderful. You know, if you're Reuben, 
You set out fourth, that's great. That's the best place for you to be. I remember listening, I, I, I do pay attention to sports, but I have to be careful. It's interesting, in a family of six children and two parents, there's only one child that really likes sports. Uh, in fact, if, <laughs> Kenneth's memories of traveling with his father are going down the road hearing scratchy uh, yeah, static. <laughs> <laughs> they also love the Statlers, right kids? <laughs> so I don't know what's wrong with my children. The Statlers are great. But anyway, I listen to sports sometimes. And this fellow said something I thought was really interesting because it, it completely misses the human condition. He says, every year, I've forgotten how many baseball teams there are. Are there 30? I'll bet there, there's close to 30. We'll say there's 30. He said, every year, at the end of the season, there's one team that's a success and all the other teams are failures. Yeah. And I thought, no wonder people... Can you understand what a lousy way that is to look at life? Except I love the Golden State beat the Cavs. I love it. It's awful. Oh. <laughs> I hate Golden State. Uh, see, this shows you what the sports do for you. Yeah. No, seriously, though. Uh, but it was Bob Mumford who said it's un-American to be second. One of the things you have to learn in growing up, what you'll find, and I found myself doing this, that I, areas I felt like I was pretty good at, I'd step out and do it. If I didn't think I was very good, I wouldn't do it because I didn't want to be uh, second rate. What does this do to you in your human experience? It limits you. and it, See, the thing is, is that I don't need to be as good at playing the piano as Doug is. I need to be as good as John is. Now, I can be better. I am blessed by how good Doug is. But do you understand? If, I'm, if my concern is I'm not as good or better than Doug, where's my joy in the piano? I don't have it because I'm comparing myself. Have you noticed the scripture says don't compare yourself to others? It's kind of a fine line because we do want to improve ourselves. We want to develop the gifts that God's given us. But you see, my job is not to be like Johnny or Ron or Dave. It's to be like me and to allow Yeshua, the Messiah, to be formed in me. I found, and I even see this in some of my kids, if there's an area they don't think they're very good at, they won't even try it. Because who wants to be less than the best? And you kind of have to watch that. Uh, I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. He doesn't say run and win. He says run in the way. In other words, give it everything you have. Pour yourself into it. And, and the great thing about life is there's not just one first place. But I've noticed something, too, about sports. There are a lot of ways that you can enhance your performance, some of them illegal. And they did a survey of Olympic athletes here a few years ago, and they said if there was a product that would allow you to excel at your sport, but it would cost you five, ten years off your life, would you use it? What percentage do you think of the people said they would? Higher. Almost all of them. It was, it was 70, 80 percent. It was just incredible. And I think, well, see, here's the thing. I have a little bit of this competitive thing in me. And I wouldn't say it's all bad, but you have to be real careful because it can surely be misused. It's not about beating other people. It's about, you know, in Israel, there was one that was number one, Judah. Can you imagine, was Naphtali a bad tribe because they're 12? No. Did Israel need them? Yes. Are they a, you know, it's a little bit like an orchestra. An orchestra is a classic example because I played brass. And if you're playing marches, 
that's a great place to be as brass. If you're playing symphonies, holy cow. You're going to be an arithmetic major. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, forty-six, two, three, four, fifty-two, three. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You count off a hundred measures. Oh, I missed my note. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you go to a symphony and you listen to it, and even if the brass don't have a lot, if they play when it's their part, it enhances the whole number. And I mean, it's like one of my favorite pieces is Tchaikovsky's ballet, ballet Swan Lake. And the place where the swan unfurls and the French horns come in, ba 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 ba. Every I can even talk about it now. It gives me chills. It is so beautiful. But everybody does their part. And if you were to go to the, the director and said, "What, what part of the orchestra could we take out of this?" What would he say? <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> we have racial prejudice and we have instrument prejudice. When I first started in studying uh, the score of that, I'm going to forget this director who said, the first thing you do is you look at the score and then you throw the saxophone part away. <laughs> <laughs> there are people here that play saxophone that might feel kind of bad about that. <laughs> no, it, it is. But I mean, seriously, when you think about it, every part important. Some are maybe more visual. <laughs> but I think if we're really walking with the Lord, one of the ways we can encourage people is to help them see that what God called them to be and who they are is priceless, valuable, and essential. That they're, Because there's something in this need to be what we're not that destroys us. And also it causes us to throw aside the inheritance God has for us. And when you look at this whole battle between Esau and Jacob, it was, a, it was one of the uh, old Jewish rabbis I've been reading, a guy named Rabbi Lord Sachs, helped me to see that Jacob, when he was trying to take from Esau what was Esau's, actually was hurting himself. And when Jacob came back to the land, I totally missed this. He went to Esau and he called him my Lord. He said, you know, he says, what do you want? I'll give it to you. Everything he tried to take from Esau, he gave it back because he was now happy with who he was. He wasn't trying to take what was... And I, there's such peace in being who you are and seeing God's order. And it's, we're getting close to uh, our time to close. I, and I know Joy and I have talked about this before too. And, and sometimes you can be perplexed. You say, what's my call? What am I supposed to do? And when people say that, you know what they really mean? I don't think my call's quite glamorous enough. Oh, not necessarily. <laughs> no, not, not necessarily. But that's part of what happens. Is we, we you know, we, we, when I'm, because usually we know what it is and we think, you know, it's like somebody said, is there another opinion? But uh, I remember Jamie, and I love Jamie, you know, because he was very open about struggles he'd gone through. Jamie was a natural communicator and a wonderful writer. And God took him through a series of experiences in his life and he really didn't launch into his writing career probably until he was about 40. And he just became a new person because he found what he was created to be. And yet he realized every step along the way God had used, but, but it wasn't until he, would, he became a writer. And here's the interesting thing. He was a wonderful writer. He was a fantastic storyteller. He was a horrible speller. <laughs> horrible. And I know people that think they can't write because they can't spell. A lot of us that can spell can't write. <laughs> Don't let people put you down what you can't do. See, what, one of the things I've learned as you grow up and get mature, if you can't do something, hook up with someone who can. That's, that's how the kingdom works. You know, work things together. But, uh, and then there are people like Mark Twain who said, if you can't think of more than one way to spell a word, you have no imagination. <laughs> See, and I, and I can spell pretty good, but... He was your hero. <laughs>
And Mark, you know, I don't know if Mark Twain's had half the things he's supposed to have, but boy, <laughs> that poor guy. He said, Salt Lake City is the only place where a Jew is a Gentile. <laughs> and he did say that. <laughs> he also said the coldest winter he ever endured was summer in San Francisco. My favorite story of Mark Twain, though, is that this woman came to him and said, I, the doctor tells me I've got a terminal disease. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he says, well, you need to stop smoking, swearing, and what I've left for, oh, drinking. She says, I don't do any of those. And he says, lady, you have no capital. <laughs> okay, a couple things here. Let's get serious again. One of the things in our life that I, I started off with today that I think is so essential, and I have to say it a lot because I need this reminder, and that's live for other people. Take care of yourself, but live for other people. Pour your life out. Uh, give yourself away, because if you're hanging on to yourself, Yeshua is absolutely right. If you're going to find your life, you're going to lose it. Our life, we get our life by giving it away. That, that's absolutely the truth. But understand that God calls us to do different things. In Luke 8, you remember the story. It's about the Gadarene uh, demoniac, some Bibles will call it. Luke 8, verse 37. And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into a boat and returned. Why did they ask him to leave? Because he'd cast the demons out of this man into a herd of swine. What did the swine do? They ran off the cliff. So, I mean, this, this was kind of a big deal. And so they said, please go. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Yeshua had done for him. Now, is this what Yeshua told everybody? Remember when the rich young ruler came to Yeshua? And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Yeshua says, well, keep the commandments. Don't murder, don't kill, covet. <laughs> the guy's response always takes my breath away. All these I've done from my youth up. He has a fairly good opinion of it. And so Yeshua says, when he heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. He tells him exactly the opposite thing he tells the other man. Aren't they both in the kingdom? They absolutely are. They have a different job. One of the things we we're, we're find fulfillment in is when we find out what God's called us to do, and if we're the only one left, we just keep doing it. One of the things I find myself once in a while is I'm looking for the applause of the crowd. I'm looking for somebody else to be with me. As long as I'm doing that, who am I serving? Myself and people. And, and then the final one that I, not the final one, but just another example. In John 21, you remember this, uh, that the uh, disciples were out in a boat fishing, which is just the true example of being confused. They hadn't fished for three years. Yeshua is gone. They don't have to do it themselves. They're out on a boat fishing. In some ways, it, there's so many evocative pictures here. And then they see Yeshua on the shore. They come in and he's fixed them some breakfast. And then he starts talking to uh, Peter. And in verse 18 of John 21, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. He's pointing out that there's going to be a time in Peter's life that it sounds like he's describing the way of Peter's death. You all know Peter was crucified upside down. That's how he died. Now, he, this he said signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Oh, and said, 
So Peter, seeing him, said to Yeshua, Lord, and what about this man? Now, what's the dynamic going on here? Peter, this is what's going to happen to you. And Peter's going, well, that's a great blessing. What about him? <laughs> Yeshua said to him, if, you want to, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Many things apply to all of us. They really do. But one of the true ways of finding happiness is, number one, to give yourself away. Be happy with who God made you. That's why what's going on in our world today, the abortion, the transgender, all of this is a movement to make myself so I'm happy. It's not working. <coughs> like I told you, suicides in the U.S. have gone up 30% among successful people with money, people that, quote, have everything to make them happy. And they're, when you commit suicide, you'd have to admit that you feel like you've come to the end of all hope. That, that's the only reason you do that. He'd probably be happier. No, that isn't it. I, you know, I'll be honest. I've thought of that too. The interesting thing to me in that story, well, there's several things, but at least my view. The fact that Yeshua asks him to sell everything he has means that his stuff had become his God. That, that's what he was living for. And it, it, one of the things that, that you always have to remind yourself is just because God's telling you to do something doesn't mean he's telling somebody else. And have you ever noticed when the Lord really puts a message heavy on you, the first thing you want to do is get up and tell everybody else to do it too? <laughs> I mean, I wish that weren't how I was, but... <laughs> and there's, there's a certain el element of this that's good. I mean, it, like Ron was sharing what he does every morning, and, and Greg and Lois have got some things they do, and all of you have things. The issue is not to imitate me, or Greg, or Ron, but there is an issue that you're taking time in your life where you're listening to the Lord. That may look different for every one of us, but... And, and just to find that happy medium sometimes can be a challenge. But I, I think as we bring this to a close, I'm convinced the most common, most frequently quoted statement of Yeshua's is that one I mentioned. He that finds his life will lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake will find it. I look at my parents, the people I grew up around. I mentioned Jerry. So many of you are special to me. The older ones that went before me, a lot of those that have gone on. Ernest and Bliss and Owen, all these guys. And what I noticed that really impacted me was they gave their lives away. I, I've never forgotten my dad describing Ernest getting a pair of uh, slippers from his family and he came before the council and he said, I'm consecrated. Does somebody else need these more than me? And he wasn't putting on a show. That's just, that's who he was. I thought he was kind of crazy, but when I think about it, I'm blown away. I'm blown. That, that, that to me, when I see that kind of dedication and sacrifice, that's what built, that's why this place is where it is right now. It's because those who gave their lives away. And something you learn in... Uh, when you take care of animals. When the cows come in off the range, you can tell which cows have the good calves by looking at the cows and not the calves. It's the skinny cows have the good calves. <laughs> if a cow comes in with a lot of fat on her, you're going to find some puny little thing that didn't get anything to eat. And, uh, you know, it, there's another story about these two buckets that the lady at the house, every day she carried them to the well and brought them back home. And the one pail felt really bad because it had a leak in it. And it was whining to the other one. It said, well, listen, the other one said to it, tomorrow when we, we go down, she takes us down there, notice the side of the path that you're on that she carries. And when the bucket looked, there were flowers because where the bucket had been leaking, 
The lady was watering flowers every day. And I thought, you know, in some ways I hope I'm leaking. I hope something is coming out and, and nurturing other people. Let's all stand. Pam, would you close for us, please? Oh, Lord, just so appreciative that you've come with your presence and showered your love and concern over us and over John's teaching and Ron's teaching and <coughs> Sharon and the music and we, we just love every aspect that you've given us this Sabbath morning and we just continue to look to you uh, as our source and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.